Okay, um, we're ready to start the next session. Uh, at least Ron and I am I'm back. We also have a lot of participants. Um, so um, this is the third session for the Applied Networking Research Workshop uh, we have today. There's another one tomorrow. And um, for those people who haven't been in the first two sessions, uh, we quickly uh, announce a couple of things again. So on the next slide, um, we definitely want to thank our sponsors again. Um, this virtual meeting has less costs than usually, but without the sponsors, it's not possible. Next slide. Um, then this slide, you find all the slides in the proceedings uh, in the data tracker, so you can also go there and download the slides and look there, because here you find um, the link to join the Slack channel we have for this workshop, if you haven't joined yet. Um, this Slack channel is particular um, useful when you want to have discussions with the author authors after the session, because right now we have the chat in session, but this goes away after the session. Um, all papers and the whole program is also not only in the data tracker, but also on the uh, workshop web page and the proceedings are for free available from the ACM library. Um, one quick note, um, as all ITF sessions, this session will be re recorded and put on YouTube afterwards. So please be aware of that if you want to say something or join with you or whatever. Next slide. Um, then we will um, also for the question and answer session, uh, we will use the queuing uh, function provided in Meet Echo. If you want to ask a question, please join the queue by pressing this little button, which shows a microphone and a hand, uh, which you find below your name in the upper uh, left corner. And there's also more information on how to use Meet Echo um, somewhere on the IETF webpage or you use Google to find it. Next slide. Okay, and that's where we are right now. We are in the um, third session. We have um, four talks today. So if everything went well, we have a little bit um, slack time at the end and we can take some more questions or we can you know, finish the day earlier. Um, we have two long papers and two short papers, or actually two, we call them short papers and position papers. Um, um, and the first talk will be held by Corey and Eldon. Corey and Eldon is a postdoc at the University of Liege. Um, in his PhD thesis work, he was working a lot on network measurements and protocol designs, and we were together in a project actually uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, and now he's focusing his work more on service assurance for intent-based networking. And this talk will focus on path brokenness in TCP. So that's quite exciting, and we can start right away. Hello everyone, my name is Corian Adolin. I am from the University of Liège. And this study is entitled Evaluating the Impact of Path Brokenness on TCP. So I will start first with a short introduction on what is path brokenness. The idea of path brokenness is based on the end-to-end -end internet architectural guideline, which has been first laid down in an RFC in RFC 1958. Well, the idea is based on this conceptual opposition between dumb networks and intelligent endpoints. And by pushing intelligence to the endpoints, you supposedly guarantee and maximize flexibility and extensibility of the internet. So this is an example of an end-to-end -end path. Of course, more and more intermediate devices do not conform to this principle and apply various policies up to the application layer. Those devices have been coined as middle boxes by RFC 32-34 and they introduce a phenomenon also known as ossification of the network infrastructure. A lot of studies have shown that this phenomenon is a major cripple for the deployment of new TCP features and for the deployment of new transport protocols. To study how they break paths, we introduce the concept of pass condition, which is a description of an action performed by middle box on a packet on a given pass. 
first you can have a blocked feature so if a client tries and establish a TCP connection with a feature enabled the middle box blocks it and then if it retries with the very same packet and the very same feature disabled and then the middle box forwards it you have a blocked feature You can also have a remove feature, which is the soft counterpart of the block feature. So in this scenario, a client tries and establishes a TCP connection by sending a sync packet that contains a given TCP options. But when the middle box receives it, it removes it, either by replacing it with zero or by shrinking packet size and forwards it. So the feature has been removed. And of course, obviously, you can have a change feature when you send sin packet with feature value A. A middle box requires it from A to B. So the server believes client sends feature value B. This is a change feature. So why does this happen to packets? Well, it can be the action of a lot of different policies which can have security or performance purposes even for packet marking which is not strictly speaking a middle box behavior but that we choose to consider as so because it has very similar consequences so those pass conditions they can lead to pass impairment which is the actual pass brokenness and which is the middle box induced consequences in terms of connectivity issue or decrease or shortfall of quality of service for instance you can have blocked traffic if you try and establish tcp connection with a feature enabled which is blocked by a middle box and you are not configured to retry without it which is now known as a fallback mechanism then you have blocked traffic can have a disabled feature. So here, uh, both endpoints try and advertise their support for the selective acknowledgement option, but the mailbox removes it in both directions. So now, the feature is disabled in both directions. You can have a disruption of the negotiation when in this example, client and a server advertises their Windows scaling parameter value, which is being rewritten systematically by a middle box to five. So it doesn't disable the feature, but it disrupts its negotiation phase. And finally, you can have traffic disruption impairments. So this is a little bit more complex. So first, client and server uh, establish a TCP connection with SAC supported in both directions. Then the sender sends three data packets of 20 bytes each. But in the middle, we have this middle box that performs sequence number remapping. Okay, So it remaps all sequence numbers from sequence space A to sequence space B. For some reason, second packet gets lost in the way. So the client tries and acknowledges first received packet using the ACK field and last received packet using a SAC block because it's not consecutive. When the middle box receives this SAC, this ACK segment, it has to remap it back to sequence base A but it should also remap the SAC block. The problem is that parsing a SAC block means parsing a linked list potentially on every packet. And this is something that you want to avoid, especially on highly loaded devices, because it takes a lot of CPU time. So most of those middle boxes, they just ignore the SAC blocks. So in consequences, when the sender receives it, it has an invalid SAC block in it. So now the outcome will depend on the implementations, but at the minimum, we will lose the SAC block. And at worst, we will lose the entire packet.
So we have observed those phenomena in the wild in previous studies. And here is a few important numbers, which has to be considered as lower bounds. So we showed that 2% of deployed network devices are actual TCP IP middle boxes. We found 38.9% of network paths are actually crossing at least one middle box. And 6.5% of all network paths are affected at, by at least one potentially TCP breaking middle box. So we build our testbed based on VPP and we developed a middle box plugin for VPP called MMV. VPP stands for Vector Packet Processing and is a kernel bypass framework developed by Cisco. So we developed MMB in order for it to be flexible, intuitive and fast. Of course, we want it to be fast because we don't want it to be an extra overhead when uh, analyzing the impact of pass impairments on quality of service, of course. We choose to study the impact of pass impairment on TCP by focusing on those three TCP features, ECN, SAC, and window scaling parameter, because they are widely used and because they are so widely impaired. And the idea is to characterize a little bit more precisely how do pass impairing middle boxes affect the quality of service of TCP. So to this end, we build a test bed in two different setups, a direct and an indirect setup. Direct setup is simply two traffic generators communicating together, exchanging data in order to compute baselines. And in the indirect setup, we include a network simulator, which would simulate various network conditions, as well as various pass conditions. To this end, we introduce artificial delay, artificial loss, artificial congestions, and uh, even elephant conditions. First, the explicit congestion notification. So the idea of this feature is to have a router reporting congestion without dropping packets instead by flipping bits in the IP header. So it relies on bits in the transport header for the endpoints to communicate together and by two bits in the IP header to notify their support for ECN and for the router to mark the packet as congestion experienced. So we recreated three pass impairment scenarios first without congestion, a disabled ECN scenario with a router systematically changing the IP ECN bits to 1 1, so congestion experience, but with the fallback mechanism of ECN enabled, a blocked ECN scenario and a broken ECN scenario, which is similar to the disabled ECN, but which is done in a way that the fallback mechanism cannot detect, which is the case when you only apply this modification when those two bits are not zero, and which is something that happens in the wild. Rarely, but it happens. So this is the median received data over time of the three scenarios plus the baseline. First, we see the green line very close to the dotted line, which means that the disabled ECN scenario is not impacted. The orange line is roughly parallel to the green line with an extra step of one second, which is the time before it retries without ECN, which is perfectly normal. So it is not impacted more than that. 
And finally, we see that the broken ECN scenario is impacted a lot and barely transmit data compared to the other. And this is the case because uh, TCP is reacting to CE ECN bits by reducing the size of its window. And if you systematically reduce the window, it is sized to the minimum. Of course, we want to emphasize that you should not disable ECN by default. So to this end, we also recreate two pass impairment scenario with congestion, with enabling and disabling ECN. In this example, you can see that it entirely prevents from any retransmissions caused by congestion. While when ECN is disabled, you have a lot of retransmissions. Of course, it, ECN do not always prevent from retransmissions, but in this scenario, it is, and it's important. It's, it is important to mention. So what we showed is that broken ECN slows down the connection to its minimum of one MS per RTT. And we insist that disabling ECN should not be the per default solution because ECN is very useful. Next, we investigate the selective acknowledgement. So the idea of the selective acknowledgement is to acknowledge non-consecutive data chunks. So we recreate three pass impairment scenarios with artificial loss and SAC enabled, a SAC disabled, and a broken SAC with this reshuffling box in the middle. So here is the median bandwidth per packet loss rate. So this is per artificial packet loss because we have a, a minimum 0.001% of packet loss in our test bed that we couldn't eliminate and which is the cause of this difference at 0% packet loss, artificial packet loss. So what we observe here is that disabling SAT leads to a higher bandwidth for packet loss rates lower than 0.9%, while enabling SAC leads to higher bandwidth for packet loss rates higher than this value, which is related to our test bed. So why does it do it? Because having SAC block enabled means parsing SAC blocks means parsing a linked list, which consumes CPU time, a lot of CPU time. And on the other hand, disabling SAC leads to spurious retransmission. So you have to retransmit packets that you already received because you are not able to acknowledge them. And we see that for packet loss rates, lower than 0.9%, CPU time of parsing SAC blocks is more expensive than spurious retransmission. And then after the 0.09% of packet loss, it is more expensive to retransmit all those packets than to parse those SAC blocks. And finally, the broken SAC is at the bottom of the figure because it barely transmits any packets at all, at the exception of the 0% artificial packet loss. But basically, as soon as you experience your first, first loss event, the connection stalls completely. This is because the sender discards the entire ACK packet, even the ACK number, not only the SAC block. And this is the total retransmission in function of the packet loss rate. So, of course, this has to be put into perspective with this other figure because you have more retransmission if you have more bandwidth. But you observe a similar phenomenon with this a threshold of 0.09% 0, 0 between SAC and disabled, disabled SAC. So in conclusion, we 
showed that broken sack stores completely completely the connection as soon as the receiver generates a single sack block and we show that disabling sack leads to a lower throughput but only after this threshold of 0.09 percent next we investigate the window scaling parameter so the idea of this feature is to extend the tcp receive window by introducing a fixed offset shift of 2 to the power of the parameter, which is particularly useful in the context of elephants network, so high delay, high bandwidth networks. So we recreate pass impairments scenarios with artificial delay, a clipped window scaling parameter with a middle box systematically reducing the parameter to uh, an arbitrary value or even removing it which is equivalent to setting it to zero so this is the median throughput per combination of delay and clipped with scale uh, value we analyzed uh, four different congestion control algorithm uh, for the sake of completeness so what we can see here is that obviously clipping down and removing the window scaling parameter has a direct impact on the maximum achievable throughput of a tcp connection but it can also be very problematic for instance let's, let's take the most widespread clipped with scale value which would be seven so if you are experiencing this pass condition and have as soon as you experience 100 milliseconds of delay you are not able to reach one gigabits of throughput so in summary we showed that window scale impairment have a direct impact on the maximum achievable throughput and that this is going to be more and more of a problem in the future so in conclusion, what did we learn about middle boxes? We learned that they are prevalent in today's internet. We tried to show in this study that they are problematic to existing TCP features. And we learned by other studies that they are also problematic to transport evolution. So what are they going to be in the future? This is probably going to be determined by the problematic of encryption by default of the transport layer. So on the one hand, you can choose not to encrypt the transport layer by default and go the middle box proof TCP way, such as MPTCP did. On the other hand, you can choose to uh, ensure middle box proofness by encryption, like Quick is doing. So thank you. OK. Um... Now we go directly into the question and answer session. Um, let's see, we have uh, Corian here, only on audio, not on video, but we can take questions. Maybe let me start with one question. Um, this is a little bit maybe not like to the heart of the paper, but you had one slide in there which showed some measurements from a previous paper, I think you did. Um, and there was like, uh, I don't know, 6% of, of uh, middle boxes that break TCP, but there was also a large percent of middle boxes which seem to not break TCP. Can you l l say a little bit more what these middle boxes are and how you define a middle box there? So we define middle box on the basis of the past conditions. So if they were doing any blocking, any rewriting or any stripping of options, but uh, a lot of those modifications are harmless because either they are well handled by fallback mechanism or because they are done on uh, fields specifically designed to be modified in transit. And uh, yeah, the wide majority of uh, middle boxes do not break pass. Okay, so those middle boxes are also um, safe for kind of evolution if you change something or it's just like with the current traffic pattern we have? That's a good question. 
it depends if they they might implement some kind of white listing so in that case it they might be harmful for evolution but uh, we cannot tell from the data that we have okay thank you um we have a little bit of time for more questions yeah we have one question oh did it press the right button yes that's great um so you uh, investigated uh, some specific um, uh, middle box uh, uh, pathologies, I guess. Um, and it wasn't clear to me, are those specific impairments ones that uh, you observed in uh, real networks or are these hypothetical scenarios that you're um, investigating? So all impairments that we investigated here are uh, exist in the wild because we have measured them in previous studies. The most widespread one is the uh, uh, Secnum reshuffling box, and others are pretty rare, but all of them uh, actually exist in the wild, yes. Okay. Right, and then, and then one comment. Um, uh, you, you mentioned um, encryption by default or using Quick as um, remedies to this. I point out that the ECN uh, pathologies unfortunately cannot be solved via those mechanisms, seeing as it's an IP header field. So, yes, of course. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't see any queue anymore, so I would propose we move on. Thank you, Corin. Um, so the next speaker is Sandor Lucky. Um, he is currently working as an assistant professor at the Department of Computer Systems at the E. Edwards, uh, no, E. Edwards <laughs> Laurent University in Bucharest. I completely screwed this up. I'm very sorry. Um, maybe you can tell us later how this is pronounced. Um, he also has a PhD from the same university, uh, which he made in 2015, and uh, he is uh, very much working on active and passive measurements, but also programmable data planes, SDNs, and quality of service in general. And we um, start uh, with his talk on congestion control in independent offer schedulers. Hello, my name is Shandor Lucky. I'm going to talk about an L4S AQM proposal which relies on our core stateless resource sharing framework. There are traditional applications like gaming, voice transmission, SSH that require low latency for good user experiences. However, these applications generate low throughput traffic that do not build up queues along the forwarding path. In this case, strict priority scheduling seems a feasible solution for ensuring low delay for the selected applications. However, with the technological evolution, applications requiring high throughput and low latency at the same time have emerged. Just think of HD 4K video conferencing, augmented reality, virtual reality, remote control of robots, and so on. In these cases, simple priority-based scheduling is not enough. It's not a good solution since it leads to starvation of normal traffic. So how to ensure low latency and high throughput at the same time? So this is a complex problem and it is affected by both endpoints and the network. The endpoints, we can use different congestion controls. In the network, there are buffers of various sizes and AQMs. Most applications use TCP. Loads based classic congestion control needs large buffers to have full link utilization. Actually, these loss based approaches fill the intermediate buffers by design and thus they result in large queuing delays. Of course, AQMs can reduce the queuing delay significantly, but still, for full utilization, we cannot go below a limit. On the other hand, scalable congestion control enables much finer rate control. It cannot only react to the fact of congestion, but its reaction is proportional to the congestion level. DCTCP and TCP Prague are two well known examples for scalable congestion control, but the recent BBR version 2 also implements a DCTCP-like scalable mechanism. 
In general, they can reduce the queuing latency significantly, but in turn require ECN support and are too aggressive for the coexistence with classic congestion controls. To solve these incompatible issues between classic and scalable sources, L4S Internet Service has recently been proposed. It promises ultra-low latency, low loss and scalable throughput for L4S traffic. L4S flows apply scalable congestion control. Its design goals include isolation of L4S and classic traffic, and it also aims at providing window fairness between L4S and classic flows, enabling their coexistence in the same system. A current state of the art L4S AQM is dual pi square. We will use this method as a reference AQM in the evaluation section. The main reason behind the incompatibility of L4S and classic traffic is that they require different congestion signal intensities. Dual pi square solves this problem by applying different signal intensities, ECM marking or drop probabilities for L4S and classic traffic. In nutshell, dual pi square maintains two queues, one for L4S and another one for classic packets. L4S queue is controlled by a native AQM, a DCTCP like step or red AQM, and marks the packets with EC and congestion experienced. For classic queue, pi square is a AQM is applied, dropping or ECM marking packets with a calculated probability. However, the two AQMs cannot work independently. The output of classic AQM is also used for determining a coupled marking probability. It is also considered during the ECM marking of L4S packets. As a result, this coupling mechanism leads to higher signal probability for L4S and lower for classic packets. Dual pi square works very well if you consider a single classic and a single scalable congestion control behavior. It ensures different signal intensities for the two classes, but cannot differentiate between the flows inside the same congestion control family. In the recent years, several congestion control congestion control proposals have emerged, both scalable and classic ones, and for example, BBR version 2 can also work in both classic and scalable modes. RTTM furnace is well known, but there are further problems. For example, the aggressiveness of congestion controls from the same family could also be different and may raise incompatibility issues. Most AQMs also have an assumption on the congestion control behavior. And what if it is not accurate? Let's see an example for the incompatibility of two scalable congestion controls, DCTCP and BBR version 2. The left figure illustrates the case when a step AQM is applied, which is similar to the native L4S AQM of dual pi square. Without going into details, we can clearly see that with step AQM, the CTCP flows get much higher share than BBR ones. The right figure shows when our in-network resource sharing method is used, uh, we can see reasonable fairness. The key problem is that DCTCP and BBR version 2 require different signal intensities. However, step AQM applies the same ECM marking probability for the two flows, and it leads to unfairness. On the other hand, our early core status AQM proposal can provide different signal probabilities for DCTCP and BBR flows. It doesn't require flow identification and peripheral clues, but uh, this uh, early version of our AQM cannot satisfy the requirements of L4S and classic traffic at the same time. It also requires additional packet marking before the bottleneck. The L4S AQM we propose is based on our core stateless resource sharing framework called Per Packet Value, PPV. In the Per Packet Value concept, the resource sharing policies are implemented by a packet marking mechanism that assigns a packet value, actually a simple number to each packet. The packet value is not a traffic class, but an incentive expressing the importance of the given packet in the traffic mix. Packet marking can be done for the different traffic aggregates independently, and this can be implemented in a distributed way. For different traffic classes, we can use different methods to calculate the values of individual packets. The routers in the network then aim at maximizing the total value delivered without having any information on the traffic aggregates and the policies to be applied. They solely use 
the packet value carried by the packet and the decision on which packet to drop or ECM mark or which packet to forward. Accordingly, in case of congestion, packets with the smallest packet values are dropped or marked with ECM congestion experienced. In the pair packet value framework, if we have a flow and we apply policy A, this policy determines the packet value distribution of packets belonging to the flow. The role of packet marking is essential. In the following example, we assume two constant bitrate flows called flow number one and flow number two. The marking is based on a function that we call throughput value function. In this example, the two flows represent two separate traffic aggregates having independent packet markers. The throughput value functions used for packet value calculation are the same. It means that in case of congestion, we expect fair resource share between the two flows. In this example, we only distinguish 10 different packet value levels from 1 to 10 as seen in the figure. For each throughput value, the associated packet value is seen on axis epsilon. The throughput value function defines the expected contribution of packets with given packet values and the total traffic of the flow. In our example, the sending rate of flow number one is 80. Uh, and in this case, packet value is 10 between throughput 0 and 10 on the throughput value function, which means that if we filter out packets, with packet value 10, their throughput share in the total traffic of flow number 1 should exactly be 10 megabit per sec. Similarly, uh, the contribution of packets with value at least 9 is 20 megabit per sec, with at least 8 is 30, with at least 7 is 40 megabit per sec, and so on. The sending rate of flow number 2 is 50 megabit per sec, and the bottleneck is 60. Since the same throughput value function is used and the ascending rates are high, we expect fair share of the bottleneck capacity. Dropping packets with the minimum packet value leads to an observable packet value threshold below which all packets are dropped. And in this case, this threshold value is 8. And it results in 30 megabit per sec allowed traffic or allowed throughput for both flows. This animation illustrates how bottleneck works in the previous example. Our L4S AQM proposal called Virtual Dual Queue Core Stateless AQM can be deployed in a per packet value domain where the packets are marked with packet values in advance. Similarly to dual pi square, it also maintains two queues. L4S traffic is directed into Q0, while classic into Q1. Our AQM method also maintains two virtual queues for two reasons. First, virtual queues can be used for reducing queuing latency in the physical buffers. And second, they can keep histories of packet values used for calculating stable congestion threshold values. Each L4S packet updates both virtual queues with its size and the packet value. If packet size fits into both virtual queues, the packet is enqueued into the L4S physical queue. Classic packets only updates virtual queue VQ1 and the packet is stored in the physical Q1. We extend the original virtual queue concept since a virtual queue not only counts the packet sizes but maintains a histogram of observed values. Similarly to traditional virtual queue concept, VQ0 and VQ1 in our system have a maximum size and a serving rate that is less than the outgoing capacity. Packets are served from the two physical queues with a simple strict priority scheduler, L4S first and then the classic. You can recognize that virtual Q0 represents the value distribution in the L4S traffic, while virtual Q1 stores the capital distribution of both L4S and classic packets. From these distributions and the predefined serving rates and delay targets of the virtual queues, two congestion threshold values can be calculated. CTV0 is applied for the L4S traffic only, while CTV1 for both traffic families. They are simple filters. For L4S packet, if uh, its packet value is above both thresholds, the packet is forwarded. Otherwise, we mark the packet with ECN congestion experienced. For a classic packet, 
we only check CTV1. In practice, congestion threshold values can be translated into congestion signal intensities. This coupling mechanism is similar to dual pi square and it ensures fairness between F4S and classic flows. Our evaluation testbed consists of three machines connected in a chain topology, a traffic generator, a receiver, and a bottleneck in the middle. We implemented both dual pi square and our core stateless AQM in the PDK. Uh, NetM tool was used to emulate uh, RTT. Uh, we also modified the bottleneck rate between 1 gigabit per sec to 10 gigs. And we use different congestion controls in the generated traffic and the tool we use is uh, iperf2. In the first scenario, we compare the performance of the two AQMs under changing traffic intensities using DCT, CPS, L4S and Cubic as classic congestion control. In case of our AQM, all flows use the same throughput value function, meaning equal desired resource sharing. The experiment consists of nine phases, varying the number of L4S and classic flows. Each phase lasts 20 seconds and the number of L4S and classic flows can be seen on the top of the figures. We can clearly see that both AQMs provide good flow fairness even among different traffic classes if the number of flows is large. Our method uses virtual queues that results in slightly lower use utilization than dual pi square. It's about 98%. Okay, in the first phase, a single DCTC flow is not able to fully utilize the bottleneck link. With our AQM 0.8 gigabit per sec flow throughput can be achieved, but dual pi square results in even worse utilization of approximately 30%. This phenomenon is, doesn't appear uh, with a single classic flow in the last phase. With one L4S and one classic flows, both methods show significant unfairness. Dual pi square gives larger share to classic traffic. In contrast, our AQM favors DCTCP. We believe that this is mainly due to the difference in strict priority and time shifted FIFO scheduling of the two approaches. The 19th percentile and the average queuing delays are similar for both methods. Dual pi square results in slightly smaller delays for L4S, but our approach also provides average delays in submillisecond order. Except some temporal peaks, significant maximum delay can only be observed if the number of flows is limited. As the more flows arrive in the system, the maximum delay also goes below 1-2 milliseconds with our approach. We also repeated the previous scenario by replacing DCTCP with BBR version 2. We can clearly see that dual pi square cannot control BBR traffic well, leading to increased queuing delays and significant unfairness between L4S and classic traffic. In general, if the number of BBR flows is large, classic traffic experiences a very low throughput share. BBR applies a complex model-based congestion control. We assume that the opposite chaotic behavior is caused by that the BBR's model is not prepared for this complex network behavior. With our core stateless AQM, almost perfect fairness can be seen in most phases. The largest deviance is shown for the single FOS and single classic case. The advantage of our method is clearly visible in this scenario since it can automatically learn the congestion signal probabilities of various flows from the absurd packet value distributions. Our approach also provides smaller delays for both L4S and classic traffic. Since the propagation RTT on the internet is heterogeneous, we consider a scenario where flows with different RTTs, 5 and 40 milliseconds, coexist in both classes. The experiment consists of seven phases where the number of flows for each traffic class RTT parse are shown on the top of the figure. Our AQM provides better but not perfect fairness, while dual pi square cannot handle the heterogeneity and RTTs well. With our method, L4S traffic with 5 millisecond RTT occupies more bandwidth than their fair share. 
which is more visible when flow starts leaving the system. It seems that DCTCP flows with small RTT can adapt to the new conditions much faster, occupying the freed resources. We also repeated the experiment with BBRS L4S congestion control. With dual pi square, the unfairness between L4S and classic classes is more significant than with DCTCP. BBR traffic almost fully suppresses cubic flows. On the other hand, our course latest AQM provides similarly good performances with DCTCP. Do BBR flows occupy faster the feed resources than classic ones, but they also allow cubic flows to increase the rate. In the next scenario, there are four different congestion controls in the same system. DCTCP and BBR are used as L4S and Cubic and BBR as classic uh, congestion controls. Similarly to previous experience, we will write the number of flows in the traffic mix as shown in the top of the figures. For our AQM, fairness is reasonable during the whole measurement. In the marked areas, the number of flows is the same. However, the classic BBR flows cannot restore the throughput when load decreases in the last phase. We assume that the BBR's model stacks in a wrong state and cannot adapt to the changed network conditions. For dual pi square, the experience fairness is much worse since uh, L4S BBR flows take the most throughput. It's 10 times more than the fair share in some cases. The behavior of classic BBR flows is again very interesting. At the start, they take a high share, while in the end, they have the lowest share. It is especially interesting to compare the first and the last intervals when the traffic mix is the same, but the resource share is significantly different. We think that BBR's model-based congestion control cannot tolerate the highly changing conditions of this scenario. Congestion control evolution is ongoing. In this wide environment, compatibility of congestion controls even within the same family cannot be expected. We need an AQM that provides different congestion signal intensities for different congestion controls. We have demonstrated that uh, our proposal provides different signal probabilities for different congestion controls by design without the need of flow identification and pair flow cues. On the other hand, it requires pair packet value marking and thus its deployment can only be feasible in closed networking domains at the moment. The proposed algorithm is lightweight and we are working on its implementation in P4. Finally, all the measurement results, including the scenarios at 10 gigs, are available in our website. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it turns out I just broke my video, so you have me without the video. Um, but at least we have Sandra here on video and Roland, <laughs> so you can see them. Um, so very first question from my side, how do you pronounce your university? <laughs> it's uh, Otwash Lorand University. Otwash Lorand was a physicist. <laughs> Okay, that sounds much easier yeah. when you say it. Yeah, um, I, I'm from, from Budapest, not from Bucharest. I see. Um, okay, then we would have time for some questions. Maybe I can go with the first question um, first. Um, so as mentioned on the very last slide, you're working on an implementation. So can you some, say something about implementation complexity, maybe also compared to the dual um, pi algorithm? I think the complexity is very similar to dual pi square. So basically our CTV based uh, method. So we have this through packet value filters. Uh, I mean, at the, that point, I mean, implementing this is very, very simple because you have the packet, the packet carries the packet value and you only have to check if it is uh, bigger uh, or greater than the, the actual value. And you can update these uh, filters periodically, similarly to dual pi square, where you update the drop probability periodically. Here, here you do the same with the uh, threshold values. Okay, so it's mainly the math that's different and probably the virtual queue handling is also a little bit different, right? Um, yeah. Okay, then we go to uh, Greg, who's in the queue again. Okay, thank you, um, very interesting work. Um, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, as noted on your last slide, 
congestion control evolution is ongoing. Um, you know, BBRV2 is a moving target. Um, also, DCTCP in L4S has migrated to TCP prog. Uh, be nice to see um, you know, evolution of, of your work um, tracking those congestion controls as they as they evolve, maybe rerunning with with the current version of prog, um, that sort of thing. Second comment um, is uh, be interesting to see a comparison of your algorithm to an FQ implementation that supports L4S uh, ECN signaling as well. Uh, and that would be uh, uh, really interesting to see both both on the performance side and the complexity side. Yeah, actually, uh, what was in our mind? So, uh, first of all, uh, our approach has the benefit that we don't need uh, pair flow queues. And for example, if you want to implement it uh, in a high speed router like a uh, barefoot Tofino or something like that, you cannot work with lots of uh, individual queues. So you have very limited uh, capabilities. And in this way, uh, you cannot do pair flow uh, queuing. And uh, in our approach, uh, I mean, at the moment we are working on a P4 implementation. So I can say that uh, this algorithm uh, with some simplification can be implemented in P4 and can run on real uh, physical hardware. However, it's uh, all of, of course uh, in the software implementation uh, part, or or if if we have a software target, it would be also uh, good to compare the results with a pair flow uh, or a flow flow queuing AQM like FQ Codel or something like that. Okay. Um, do we have more questions? Okay, then also thank you for your talk. Okay, thank you. And we go on with the next talk. Um, so that's a, a shorter talk because that's a position paper and the talk will be held by um, Danny Lashes. Um, so Danny is a PhD candidate at the University of Campinas um, and he is working on flexible network and application integration mechanisms and uh, multi-domain environments. And his talk will focus on um, Alto and how to integrate Alto into existing systems. So let's start. Hello, everybody. This is Danny from the University of Campinas. Today, I am going to introduce our position paper about the use of the ITF Alto protocol to provide multi-domain network information. This is a joint work with people at Yale University, Ericsson, Nokia, Telefonica, and Sichuan University. First, some key Alto-related terms. We have the Alto server, a logical entity providing REST-based APIs to query the Alto information services, we also have the Alto client sending Alto queries to get guiding information from the Alto server and the Alto client protocol used for sending Alto queries between an Alto client and an Alto server. The Alto working group in the ITF started in 2008 and currently Alto is discussing proposal on rechartering the working group. Alto already provides a generic framework to expose network information for applications. In particular, Alto introduces generic mechanisms such as information resource directory, information consistency, and an information update model. Alto also introduces abstraction modules, such as network and cost maps to provide network location grouping and a cost between them, the patch vector abstraction, and capability maps, such as the unified property maps and through pings capabilities. Now, I would like to make clear what we mean by multi-domain. So, a multi-domain is considered to be a network region in the global internet and each domain has a network view from the perspective of the network region. In this context, a network region can be an autonomous system, a set of autonomous systems or AGSPs, transport access networks, etc. Therefore, the multi-domain approach involves multiple network regions with different technologies and or administrations. Nowadays, many multi-domain use cases are emerging where the traffic from a source to a destination traverses multiple domains. 
data science applications and flexible interdomain routing are some examples of such use cases. However, the current Alto-based protocol is not decided for a multi-domain setting of exposing network information. For example, consider this peer-to-peer -peer deployment using Alto. With the current Alto client protocol, the Alto server in each domain will provide only local information to Alto clients. It means that the Alto client, the tracker in domain A, will receive partial in-network information, either from domain B or domain C. On the other hand, an Alto server-to-server -server protocol is necessary to allow Alto server to exchange information so that the Alto client may receive entry information. So the key questions are, what information do multi-domain applications need? And how does the network provide that such information? On the one hand, applications interact with the network by asking them to carry traffic for a set of flows. For example, using our previous scenario, the application has two flows to transmit, F1 and F2. On the other hand, before the application can run a resource allocation algorithm to execute such submitted flows, it needs to gather some information from the network. First, the end-to-end -end cost across multiple domains the cost in terms of resource availability and sharing, for example, the bandwidth availability. And second, the application needs to find a sequence of domains and candidate paths. This means which domains are involved for the different traffic flows and one or more potential paths connecting such domains. Now, I will summarize a set of key issues in the current Alto design for gathering multi-domain network information. Regarding the server to client Alto communication, in multi-domain scenarios, it's not possible to optimize the traffic with only locally available information. Therefore, the communication among multiple Alto servers is necessary to exchange network information of multiple domains. The Alto-based protocol states that the Alto server to server communication is possible. However, such a protocol is outside of the scope of the specification. The connectivity information is the reachability between source node and the destination nodes. In order to find the resource sharing, an application needs to know which domain are involved in the data movement of each node pair. Besides, a set of candidate paths need to be computed in order to know how to reach a remote destination node. Once the multi-domain connectivity discovery is performed, an application, as an Alto client, needs to be aware of the presence and the location of the Alto server to get appropriate guidance. Those Alto servers will be located in different domains, so that multi-domain Alto server discovery mechanisms are also needed. In the current Alto framework, each domain may have its own representation of the same network inventory. For example, in this figure, suppose that the path cost for domain B is the utilization share instead of available bandwidth. In this case, both values are not comparable together. Or even if all the member domains have the same utilization share property, the form of billing may not be uniform. Domain A, for instance, may share using dollars, and domain B and C may use some other form of local unit. Applications also need to express their requirements in a query. For example, find the bandwidth the network can provide for flow F1 subject to reachability requirements, blacklist of devices, quality of service metrics, etc. The current query interface in Alto cannot express such flexible queries. Regarding the scalability, optimization problems specified by the application requirements can be computationally expensive and time consuming. For example, the number of available paths for each flow is increased exponentially with the number of domains involved. And finally, the information provided by the Alto-based protocol is considered cross grinded in several multi-domain use cases. New Alto extensions can be designed to provide fine grinded information. Using those Alto extensions for multi-domain scenarios could raise new security and privacy concerns. So, how to design a whole Alto framework? In this table, we identify the relationship between the Alto design issues and their corresponding ambitioned mechanisms to allow Alto to expose information across multiple domains. Regarding the server-to-server -server Alto communications, Alto server may consider a hierarchical or mesh architectural deployment. For example, when a hierarchical architecture is used, Alto servers in the main partition gather locally available information and send it to a central server. In a mesh deployment, Alto server may be set up in each domain independently connected to each other and gathering the network information from other domains. Multi-domain mechanisms combining domain sequence computation and paths computations need to be defined. 
or standardized computation protocols can be leveraged for aspiring this design requirement, such as BGP, BGPLS, or PCE. Here we have a couple of examples following the PCE-based architecture for computing optimal multi-domain end-to-end paths. For cross-domain Alto Server Discovery, the RFC A686 specify a procedure for identifying Alto Server outside of the Alto Client's domain. Other PCE or BGP based mechanisms could be also used. Multi-domain composition mechanisms are also required so that the network information from Alto Servers in multiple domains can fit into a single and consistent virtual domain abstraction. Here we have three proposals using mathematical programming constraints for multi-domain composition. Let's use our collaborative network scenario again to give an illustrative example. Consider each domain provided the banded property using a set of linear inequalities, where x1 and x2 represent the available bandwidth that can be reserved for float 1 and float 2 respectively. Each linear inequality represents a constraint on the reservable bandwidth over different shared resources by the two floats. For example, this linear inequality indicates that both floats share a common resource and that the sum of their bandwidth cannot exceed 100 gigabits per second. The involved domains may also exchange such properties and apply multi-domain redundancy optimization to remove cross-domain redundancy. For example, taking a look at the set of inequalities, one can conclude that the constraint in domain B and domain C can eliminate that at domain A. And finally, a unified representation can be created representing multi-domain network resource information. With a flexible and generic query language, the network can filter out a large number of unqualified domains. The language specification could be inspired in a standard or pre-standard mechanism implemented with a user-friendly grammar. Here we have two proposals of language design using a network service descriptor style and a SQL style for an Alto client to spread its available resource requirements. Alto servers also need to support mechanisms to improve the scalability and performance, such as pre-computation and projection. For example, the Alto Routing State Abstraction Extension describes equivalent transformation algorithms to reduce the redundancy in the network view as much as possible while still providing the same information. Regarding the security and privacy, Alto needs mechanisms that provide accurate sharing network information and at the same time protect each member domain. Here we have two initiatives using a secure multi-party computation protocol to collectively send the responses to the Alto client without revealing the source of any entry. As next steps, we will continue the discussions on feasibility and deployment concerns. And finally, to mention that many of the Alto members are organizing the Network and Application Integration Workshop. Please consider to participate. Okay, thank you so much for your attention and feel free to ask any questions. Okay, um, thanks a lot. We um, now we have Danny in the audio, so we would be available for questions. And I guess. Hello, can you hear me? Ah, okay. So yeah, we can hear you very um, softly, but somehow you don't show up on my screen at least. Can you say something again? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes. Can you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that seems to be fine. Okay. We have one question. Um, no, we somehow uh, somebody requested screen sharing. I don't think that was the intention. So if okay. Probably you wanted to request video as well, Danny. Sorry for the yeah. hassle here. But still, people can queue on for questions while we're trying to resolve <laughs> this issue. Um, okay, let, let me actually ask one question. Because your talk was maybe a little bit abstract about uh, metrics, can you maybe um, briefly um, iterate like which kind of metrics could be shared and how that would look like uh, more concrete. I mean, the one example you had, had there was on, on bandwidth, but um, bandwidth might be actually uh, at least available bandwidth might, might be changed quickly. So uh, what are other examples? Maybe you can go into this a little bit. Yeah, 
Uh, thanks for your question. Actually, currently we are uh, discussing a lot regarding the, the metrics because we need, after we, we define metrics, we need to generate an, a, unif a virtual unified representation. Uh, we identify two, two type of sample metrics, one related to universal uh, metrics to say something that is, for example, bandwidth, latency, and so on. Uh, that with that we can try to, uh, I think, or within that it's more easy to generate a unified representation uh, using SU or minimum, something like that. But other type of or metric that not are universal uh, Unix, uh, more related that they are numerical but uh, ordinal, for example, uh, it is more tricky. Maybe it's not easy to provide a unified representation. Maybe we can try to provide a vector representation. It's, it's, a, it's a current discussion that, that we are trying to, 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 to get more and more ideas on that. OK, so I guess people who are interested should come to the Elder Working Group and continue the discussion there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> OK, I'm waiting a few more um, seconds to see if somebody has another question. Otherwise, um, thank you to you, thank and you. we move on with the next talk. So for the next talk, we have um, Stuart. Stuart is a re researcher at Future Way Future Networks um, in Santa Clara, and also a visiting professor at the 5G Innovation Center at University of Surrey. Um, he's working mainly on the forwarding layer and deployment of technologies there. And he used to be a former area director, routing area director, and is the chair of the PAUS working group. So welcome, Stuart, and we start the presentation. Traffic engineering requirements are becoming more demanding. SDN solutions work by calculating traffic engineering paths and then allocating resources centrally, then communicating these decisions to the network nodes individually. This allows a holistic view uh, for better optimization, but it provides less resilience against perturbation in the network or in network state and delayed adaptation to network changes. Traditional routing, on the other hand, relies on distributed algorithms. These provide fast adaptation to perturbations in network state, but there's considerable overhead in data synchronization and local decisions may not always be globally optimal. So our proposal is a hybrid solution to combine the advantages of central and distributed approaches whilst avoiding the disadvantages. Conceptually centralized components are used to calculate TE paths and resource allocations. This information is communicated in a distributed manner using a link state routing protocol. We can provide this service to multiple data plane types, MPLS, MPLS SR, IP, SRV6, IPv4, and Ethernet, etc. PPR works by providing a method of injecting paths into the link state IGPs. In the data plane, a packet is then mapped to its intended path through its PPR ID. This PPR ID is a single identifier in the packet. The format of the PPR ID is data plane specific, so it might be an IPv6 address, an IPv4 address, an MPLS label, or a MAC address. When we've demonstrated that this works in a uh, hackathon, an interop. So a little case here, ABC is the shortest path, but we want for traffic engineering reasons to go ABCD. The way we do this is in the data plane, we're only going to put the PPR ID, call it little d, in the packet. But in the control plane, we provide PPR ID uh, d plus the set of identifiers uh, that it must uh, pass through, the set of node names it must pass through, and we provide this in the control plane. And this allows us to build the mapping in the, that we need for the forwarding plane to work. 
So let's look at a little example case. Uh, we have a traffic engineered repair. So the primary path is A, B, C, D. The repair path is uh, A, E, F, G, D. And we have um, some subsidiary connector paths, uh, B, F and uh, C, G, um, to deal with the case of, uh, of failures of the B, C and the C, D link. So if any node fails, any, any path um, fails, we can uh, repair it through our traffic engineered repair, repair path. Why do we need it to be uh, a traffic engineered repair path? Well, if we have a critical SLA for the traffic that's using the primary, we must also provide the same SLA um, in the backup. And this is particularly important for 5G ultra reliable low loss uh, communications or for massive IoT slices. Furthermore, high uh, bandwidth traffic carried on TE paths must not saturate best effort shortest paths um, that we would get from some other techniques. The repair paths are created in the SDN controller and, and injected at any node or for resilience in a small number of nodes in the network. So another concept we've got here is PPR graphs. Uh, so we have a draft that describes this and uh, what they use is TLVs to describe the graph as a series of lists of paths. Any node may be a source. Uh, the source node is allocated in or the set of source nodes are allocated in the graph with the S bit. And generally there is one destination node which has the D bit set. The destination has a PPR ID associated with it. So we'll see how this works. So a familiar little graph here. The primary path is still ABCD. The backup path is AEFGD plus BF plus CG. And we describe this in the graph on the on the right. So we have a TLV structure that lets us describe the PPR ID D prime and the three subcomponents of the uh, of the graph. So PPR can support both centralized and decentralized computation of the um, of the path. Any node can inject the PPR uh, path either for itself, as for example the point of local repair calculating its own repair paths, or on behalf of an SDN controller managing the repair paths. Multiple nodes can inject the repair path for redundancy and duplicates will automatically be eliminated in the IGP flooding process. Any algorithm can be used to calculate any path or graph uh, to serve the needs of the, applica of the uh, application. In other words, we can create uh, bespoke disjoint paths or lossless paths or low latency paths. Such paths are independent of any other paths chosen for any other purposes uh, because the path map is discriminated on the uh, PPR ID. So what might we do? What were we thinking of doing in future for this? Well, every path can have its own individual policy installed by the control plane for each specific PPR path. For example, we can specify the queue behavior at that part at that uh, hop, or we can specify any monitoring or OAM behavior we want to, to take path part. The path can be strategically installed by the SDN controller or tactically by an edge node. So the research question we've got is how do we define a suitable policy expression language for the PPR? Now also we note that efficiency can be uh, improved by path oriented flooding. So the path ABCD to D prime um, needs the, the red path uh, but not the blue path information. And the nodes on A, E, F, G, D to D double prime need blue but not red. So the question is how do we define a, a resilient flooding reduction system? Because we have to do this uh, without compromising one of the central uh, tenets of uh, link state protocols which is that the flooding system provides uh, a lot of the resilience. So what about, how can we sort of do more work on this resilience and robustness? We know how to build, for example, fast reroute based on PPR. 
So the question is, can we expand the PPR graph structures to provide traffic engineering between, determin between debt net nodes and also add packet rep the packet replication, elimination and reordering functions? Uh, and can we do use this to provide these facilities for new data planes such as IP? Another aspect of robustness that we think is worth further research, and that is to that is uh, to consider the case of Byzantine robustness, and a Byzantine system is one that can withstand active lying by its components. We know how to make link state protocols uh, Byzantine robust. Link Radio Perman showed how to do this many years ago uh, at MIT. We're dealing here with high-value traffic engineering and strategic 5G services, and these are a prime target for attack. So we're proposing to use we're proposing to use a link state protocol to set up these TE paths. So the research question is, can we make traffic engineered paths that are robust against Byzantine attacks or uh, accidents that have the same characteristics? In summary, PPR is a hybrid distributed routing and SDN solution which combines the benefits of centralized path computation for more efficient resource allocation with the benefits of traditional routing and the robustness that, afford, that, that affords with regard to being able to more rapidly adapt to network perturbations. Thank you for listening and uh, if you would like more information uh, please contact uh, one of the authors on the email addresses below. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation. We also have Stuart already on audio and video. That's great. Um, so we would be ready for questions at this point. So um, like my impression is that you still have a lot of research questions there um, that you need to tackle. So probably there are many open um, issues still left. But the one thing I was wondering about listening to the talk is also like, how do you actually evaluate um, this? How can you make sure that what you propose is kind of better or more secure? Um, how do we make sure it's, it's better and more secure? Well, so um one of the things we pick up is the natural distribution um, um or the well-proven distribution of uh, information through a link state routing protocol which means that um we can um, um distribute the uh, the information without having to set up a per node uh, connection from the sdn controller to every node in the um, in the network and um we know that we can, for example, um, run that system in a way such that you can stop uh, that information being corrupted by one of the uh, nodes on the path. That was the, the Byzantine work that was done that never really got deployed because nobody ever really thought it was of high enough value. But it, and they were also worried about the CPU overheads. But that work was done probably 30 years ago and uh, was laying in the, laying in the toolbox and uh, the requirements on networks have significantly uh, changed since then. Um, so, uh, so yes, we, we we've got some ideas. We've got we've got plenty of things we can do with this. We're really trying to find out whether people are interested in working with us on this, and uh, whether people are interested in deploying techniques of this sort. Yeah, I mean that's actually a good point. Um, that was also what my question was hinting for because um, I think you need to actually somehow prove that there is you know, a real benefit um, for somebody to do the investment and to do the employment, right? And sometimes that's hard. Sometimes it's easy to argue um, that something is different, but not necessary if it's too much better. Um, well, so, so PPR itself has got interesting and useful properties. So um, the, the alternative to it is, for example, a segment routing approach where you put the information in the packet and you build these bespoke paths. The other kind of alternatives are um, that you uh, construct um, um, large numbers of sort of paths and purposely put them um, in the network. And, and I've done quite a lot of work on um, fast reroute uh, in the IETF. And fast reroute is a useful technology that people want, 
but I don't think it's all there yet, but in particular around the, the, the need to maintain uh, traffic engineering of um, fast reroute paths, uh, of repair paths. And, it, and also in particular, um, we're moving to a world where we're being much more picky about uh, what we mean by assured quality um, of, the, of the path. Uh, and and the, the new work, for example, that's being done um, in uh, the ITU uh, FG uh, focus group uh, network 2030, which looked at a whole new class, of, new classes of services. Um, just taking a service that you really, really engineered, or a network slice, for example, that you really engineered, and then just throwing it in the best effort bucket doesn't seem a good idea. So, um, you know, one of the things we're interested in is how do we build a resilient network that preserves the original traffic engineering qualities despite the fact that we've gone into the failure mode and how do we do this quickly enough um uh, you know the failover times for these things are sub 50 milliseconds so we have tallis on the audio i'm sure you also want to comment on that yeah maybe you know just high level comparison right so uh, segment routing is really a minimum state solution for soft services, right? So for optimizing capacity. When you get to trying to optimize hard guarantees like hard latency and bandwidth guarantees, we need hop by hop state. And then the question is, what are the optimized mechanisms to establish the minimum amount of state uh, for the maximum amount of, you know, different flow guarantees? And we think that the graphs there provide another uh, level of optimization that we haven't seen in before because we really have only done point to point path and you can easily calculate the amount of state you need, right? So there is some good amount of qualitative assessment that could be done in comparison between, you know, PPR sitting in the middle between SR and let's say RSVPT. Yeah, I guess some more work to do. That's yes, a very high uh, level summary. And if anyone's interested in working with us, we'd be delighted to, uh, to talk to other people. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions in the queue. Currently, it doesn't look like it. Going one, going two, going three. No, that means we are done with the session for today. As you can already see um, on the on your screen, probably uh, is that we have another session tomorrow. It's only um, two more papers, but two very interesting papers around monitoring and locking. So I'm really looking forward to that session. Session, and with that, I uh, wish you a good day, evening, or morning or whatever time zone you are in and talk to you tomorrow.